All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Truth on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network. And today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Mr. Colby Reagan from North Carolina. Colby, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, Josh. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, we're going to just talk dogs for a little bit, Colby, but you kind of had a unique story that you gave to Chip out there at Autumn Oaks is one of the reasons I, we first talked. But uh, you're a coon hunter, of course. Uh, you recently delved into the realm of competition coon hunting. And so we'll talk about that, but let's talk about, you know, where it all started. How'd you get your start coon hunting? Did somebody, somebody help you along like most of us, I assume, and you know, the area that you're in, all that stuff. Give me, give me some background. All right. Well, uh, I guess where I started coon hunting at was, uh, I got my first interest in hounds really whenever I was seven, there was a man that lived up the road and my grandparents told me he had hound dogs and I didn't know him, so I was about seven, like I said, and I would slip up there whenever he wasn't home, and I would sit in his dog lot, and, you know, he had bear dogs, and I'd pet the dogs and hang out and stuff, but, you know, I'd hang out for a little bit, and then I'd leave, but uh, it took about a year before, you know, I was a little kid, and I didn't know him, so I had to get some courage up and went and spoke to him. So you was just and, over there uh, sneaking into his yard, petting his dogs while he wasn't home? <laughs> Yeah, I'd slip down through the woods and come up the, in the backside where nobody could see me, you know. And that's it. <laughs> but uh, so I just, you know, kind of, I liked the dogs and stuff. And then I got to talking to him and he was more of a bear hunter. He didn't coon hunt much. Um, he's what, you know, what really got my interest going in hounds. But he, once we became friends, uh, I wanted to go coon hunting because, you know, he just bear hunted when season was in. Right. So. He turned me on to a, another old fellow that lived. He would take, there would be eight, nine, 12, you know, young guys out there going coon hunting with this guy. And he was a, had black and tans and there'd be that many dogs at least. <laughs> what was his name? Uh, Bobby Corn yeah. was the man's name um, that I started coon hunting with. Um, he was, you know, he was a, great fella he would take you know kids and i'd bother him to death you know calling him you know we're gonna go to <laughs> yeah. every, every night i'd be on him about it what was the experience like hunting with all them other youngsters and bobby and all those dogs at one time oh my gosh it was it was crazy you know because nobody in my family hunts really i mean there's some deer hunters and stuff but not really and then in my immediate family nobody is hunters and yeah. so i was kind of the oddball and uh so yeah it was just completely off the wall <laughs> you know i loved it i absolutely loved it was uh you said not your family's not big hunters uh what took you to the outdoors in the first place because you know you get a few there's most of us are like me you know my dad wasn't a big hunter but my grandfather took me and we grew up outside hunting fishing trapping the whole works and most people that are in this sport or you know are the same way but not very many come from you know a lineage of people that aren't you know in the outdoors a lot um well my grandparents kind of lived in the country and i would you know as much time as i possibly could i would spend over there whenever i was really young yeah and you know i i kind of got into trapping first i bought me a trap from a yard sale you know like yeah. five dollars or something and uh got into trapping because i don't know i just wanted to catch stuff and you know i thought yeah. it was cool so that's really how I, you know that was your that was there. your first foray into catching your self-sufficient lifestyle in the outdoors i was the one trap at a garage sale <laughs> yeah that was it that, <laughs> that little two-door never could catch a coon in and it wasn't strong enough to keep a coon <laughs> but and that's really how i met the man up the road as i took the trap up there and see if he could you know help me fix it you know yeah. but, as you as you grew up and you was going coon hunting with your friends and 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 bobby and stuff what'd your parents think of all that oh they just i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i really don't know i, I mean I guess they thought it was good because you know i wasn't doing i wasn't getting into trouble or anything yeah. as long as i was in the woods but i don't guess they ever thought it would you know Tur uh, turn into what it has right yeah, yeah exactly when did and, you uh when did you get your first dog I got my first dog. Well, I'm going to say my first coon dog 
when I was about 16 years old. Um, the old man that I grew up with the, up the road that I bear on with and stuff, he was trading on dogs a lot all the time. And yeah. He'd come up with this blue tick, or maybe he was an English, I don't know. He wasn't papered, but um, supposed to be a good coon dog. And I really thought, you know, as long as I'd known him, he'd give me the dog or something, you know, surely. Yeah. Well, he said he wanted six hundred dollars for him and i was like golly so i was <laughs> scrounging around and come up with some money and i bought him and i'd hunted him before i bought him but he was just he wasn't super fast he wasn't real slow he just when he stuck his you know he stuck his nose in a track he was going to tree it you yeah. know so he was a pretty decent coon dog then you know he, he was he really was the, i actually went to one competition on a long time ago with him and I think a buddy of mine had a dog the same age that had died, and he said, "Here, just use these." <laughs> and he, uh, we we got casted with three young Walker dogs, and at the time, I was like, you know, I don't want no Walkers; they're wild. You know, I yeah. got this dog; just trees, coons all around you. And uh, so they took off out of there. He went up about thirty yards, peed went to the right struck and treated coon right there and they spent the rest of the t- they, time ran out on them. they couldn't find their dogs and we <laughs> won the hunt <laughs> so your opinions of walkers was dead on straight at that point yeah i was like well, i don't have any of that yeah so <laughs> so that was your your first foray into competition and we'll get into a little bit more of that but have you lived right there where do you live at exactly Right now, I live I live in Burnsville, North Carolina, which is closer to the Tennessee line, um, kind of close to Johnson City, Tennessee, and so it's fairly uh, steep right there. Right here, it is. Yeah. Yes. Is that where you is you that where you do most of your coon hunting is in them hills? Yeah. Now, now I do for sure. Uh, Fairview, where I grew up, Fetch, uh, Fletcher Fairview area, was a little less steep, but yeah. um, it's just it's grown so much now that you can't hunt really anywhere over there anymore really? so we moved over here and luckily there's still a lot of farmland and a lot of public land but yes it's very very steep <laughs> yeah what's your what's your coon population like uh it's good in pockets you know like guys there's a lot of guys that deer hunt there we've got we've actually got some really nice bucks around here yeah a buddy of mine just killed uh like a 150 right there in his driveway really? during rough yeah it was awesome. um so they'll get pictures of 10 12 coons in one you know at one time but like i said they're in pockets yeah so if you find them you're in them if not then you're gonna have to go hunt for them what did you what was the name of that old english dog or blue tick whichever he was old blue old blue that, that's real original <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> i kept him a really long time i kept him probably oh every bit of eight years yeah so he was probably what two three four years old whenever you got him no i think he was older than that i think really? he was probably three or four when i got him yeah so and, he uh, he had a good long life and you hunted him all throughout his life i assume yeah i uh, yeah, yeah I, I did and i went out west and worked and i let a buddy of mine uh take him to train a pup with while i was gone and he ended up getting loose the animal shelter got him long story short they put him down and i found out about it like six months later it's, no it's kidding yeah so well, that's disgusting it really is huh. it is what'd you they, what'd you they, do what'd you do coming off that dog i assume was there any dogs in between you know when you got him and you know when he died yeah. well whenever i got back from the harvest deal um we went i went on the wheat harvest uh through you know through the states and yeah. up into camp and um when i got back i got a black and tan and he was a he was a pretty good tree dog and he but he didn't trail good so then i got a walker that could trail good but wouldn't tree and so <laughs> yeah we did that for a little while and that's uh, that's backwards <laughs> yeah yeah i know but, <laughs> it, it was supposed that, to be the black and tan that got it struck and the walker that retrieved when it went up yeah the black and tan man if you took him by himself he'd just kind of whatever around he might lay in the bushes or something but the black and or the walker would push him yeah but he just the walker didn't tree good i don't know huh what was Reason the walker what was the walker bred like do you know 
Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. There's no telling. <laughs> so what year uh, was that? Oh, goodness. Oh, let's see, 2013, 14, Okay, so I about think. eight, nine years ago. Uh, maybe it was sooner than that. Yeah. I should have. I should have looked it up. <laughs> I, I, I could not tell you exactly. I found, uh, um, yeah, it had to have been around in there, probably 10 years ago at least. Yeah. So 10 years ago, um, you were hunting a, a, bl- a black and tan that would tree but wouldn't go hunting and a walker that would go hunting but wouldn't tree. <laughs> That's and you, it. You don't know what either one of them are out of or how they were bred? No, I, the black and tan, I did, he was papered. He yeah. was out of um, Tennessee Fiddler, I really? believe he was like that yeah, yeah. tennessee fiddler bread well, that's a good breed of black and tan he he ended up being a good dog when i got rid of him and the man that got him he uh ended up making something out of him yeah for how he hunted it worked for him but so, um when did you move on to some registered dogs that you knew what they was out of and stuff you know all the time this year all right that's well, good no, not this year ago about yeah. a year ago so you're a little over a year so in these 10 years between uh, your first registered, well-bred, uh, the whole kitten caboodle and the black and tan walker stuff, what, what was you hunting then? I had a I had a big blue tick. Uh, I found another blue tick. He was like a liver-colored dog. I traded two. I had two beagles. They yeah. were brothers. They lived in the lot together, ate out of the same food dish, ran a rabbit perfect together. But if you ever put them on a lead together, they'd kill each other. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> was, but they would go to war. So yeah. I just got over that. So I wanted to trade them. And uh, JP, the old man that I got the first dog from, he found a trade for me. Yeah. So I go and meet these people, and they've got a Ford Explorer with a dog crate in the back and then these little crates with rabbits all around it. And this dog is so big, he's hunched up and – I'm like, golly, this perfectly the dog I'm training to be. I, I, I love these stories, Colby, because, you know, we all started like this, trade dogs in the back of Explorers, and you don't know what papers or what and everything, yeah. you know, and I, I just, it's such a it's such a diverse community, and you get to see a little bit of everything, so I'm loving it. Yeah, so he gets out of there, and he's this horse of a dog, yeah. uh, liver, liver-spotted blue tick, like, foot and a half long ears <laughs> and uh i take him hunting that night and i'll be damned if we treed like three coons with him i mean really? just he didn't have a good changeover he was basically like a ball the whole way yeah but you know i kept i ended up keeping that dog for a good while i mean he he died probably four years ago yeah i'd say what and was his he, name blue big john <laughs> oh big Old john big. i like big john that's a good name yeah. He was a he pound him son. He was he was tough to whoop. He did, really was. Did they like you? So if they had answer me this, if they had crates full of rabbits and then you threw you traded him for them two beagles, how'd that go? What? Did, that, I'm sorry. Didn't you say that they was in? They had rabbit crates and everything in the back of that explorer. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. They um they were uh, oh gosh, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> I was thinking about this big old dog that I just got. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I was <laughs> ready to get out of there. You, you didn't uh, want to stick around to see the consequences of sticking the rabbit dogs in with all the rabbits. <laughs> yeah. Well, they you know, they were in their own crate. So I got you. Maybe, uh, maybe they didn't. See them. <laughs> maybe it wasn't too bad. I'd have been worried about them killing each other on the way over there. <laughs> so the old so big john turned out did you have anything between big john and this dog you're hunting now no no not really after he died um we were kind of you know looking at moving and wasn't the right time and yeah um so but yeah right. up until like i said almost a year and a half ago i got to looking for another dog and i uh went to work caretaking a piece of property and started just listening to i always like to learn stuff so i like to listen to these podcasts and listen to the old timers and interviews and stuff and decided that you know now now's the time to get into the comp hunting if i wanted to and you know yeah 
Tell me, tell me about the dog you ended up getting him and why you picked that one. So I, I have, I got a really good buddy down East that he used to do a lot of competition hunting and, uh, he knew I was looking for a dog and knew I, that's what I was wanting to do. A friend of his had one and had some stuff coming up that he knew he wasn't going to get to hunt him like he should have been. And, uh, so he's telling me about it and, uh, I get, I just decided to go down there and before before this uh you know my wife was about six months pregnant Mm -hmm. i believe um she's like well we don't need to be spending you know really i only paid a thousand dollars for this dog yeah which you know knowing what i know now i thought that was a ton of money which it still is a lot of money it is a lot of money but when you figure that you were getting old liver colored blue ticks out of explorers and you know (laughs) trading for this and that you know and it's it is i mean to be real honest i don't want to make light of it when people try to get into this but a thousand dollars is a big chunk of change to spend on a dog it is and for me at that time that's the most i'd ever you know so and he was a walker so i I was a little hesitant about it but really you know through listening to these podcasts and stuff i was like i would really always wanted to have a grand night champion dog just to say i had one really but yeah and I realized that I've hunted long enough to know what a good coon dog is. So really all I got to do is learn the rules. So, uh, found the dog and just went down there and hunted with him. And I was supposed to have been selling a dog while I was down there. And that's how I was going to really just buy him. Cause before I left, my wife said, don't buy him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so the whole time we're, we, we make our first drop and, man he just slams a coon out of the truck just right i mean just nothing doesn't say anything on the ground just bam just hammered down big loud pretty tree dog yep. you know what i'm saying uh, I, you know i like that we go turn him loose again and uh he's working a coon up this creek and does a really nice good job on it trees it well uh we got started a little late and so it was later by this point go up another little drop and cut him loose and hear him working the track a little he doesn't bark much on the track and yeah. these other boys pull up and they're wanting to buy the dog and while we're sitting here in the truck listening to him run this coon and uh the man says no i believe this boy over here is going to buy him take him back to north carolina <laughs> so i know at that point you know he wasn't you know he's was going to let me get him well i said i wanted the dog and i said well, you care if i take him you know up and just see how he, make sure he does good up here yeah before before i spend that money and he said sure enough you know that's fine and luckily it you know because i didn't even take i didn't have the money to buy him when yeah. i went down <laughs> so, <laughs> well that was uh, that was a credit to the seller right there he must have liked you because i know one of my and we don't we sell a dog a year usually you know i i, I will move a young dog that don't quite suit me but they're not taking him home yeah. You know, they can get their trial here or they can buy it without a trial or whatever. And, you know, to be honest, I've never had anybody ever come try one. Everybody's been satisfied, so that's good. But, yeah, I mean, most sellers, you know, when someone says, you know, I want to take the dog home and try it there, which is, which is good, you know, a buyer ought to be able to do that if they got the opportunity. But uh, most sellers ain't going to do that. Yeah, luckily my, my other friend that lived down there, he had vouched for me, and they're, yeah. you know, they're pretty tight. So Good, good. So you got him, you got him home and he looked pretty good. Looked good. Start, went to hunting him. And, uh, at first, you know, I was getting lessons and learning this dog and I'd never hunted like a high powered dog like this at all. Yeah. You know, <laughs> used to old blue. Like, yeah. Uh, well, will you talk about that? Cause I try to explain that to people on through the podcast and, and through, you know, whatever, that there is difference and there's levels to caliber of dog and that just going out and treeing a coon and doing all that stuff is not enough, you know, when you, when you want to up your game a little bit and start competing with some of these guys. I mean, I assume you knew that before you got the dog, but did it kind of dawn on you a little bit as you got to hunting him? yeah um you know i'd seen him do really good on three coons down there and brought him up here and he did good on a few and then he was doing such a good job on him well he went to missing a little bit or you know he was taking chance uh he he lays a lot of coons up 
uh, when they're not moving and he can work a good track, you know, he can work a track out yep. in the tree. Um, but yeah, he was, he was taking a lot of chances and I was killing, you know, his first, it was the first kill season that I had him. So right. we started tunes to him and then he just went crazy, you know, just mm -hmm. every tree in the woods and, um, uh, ended up, you know, I just, I didn't know what to do. So finally I just take him, pull him off the tree, recut him and only praise him whenever he had coons and it worked out pretty good. He's a pretty smart dog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's when you look at dogs that are, that are having accuracy trouble that didn't at one time, there's usually some, it's usually a training issue. You know, it's usually an environment issue or how someone's doing something with the dog. And credit to you for seeing that, you know, we were raining too many coons out to him. We need to recut him and do something different and, you know, got him fixed up. It sounds like. Yeah. He's, uh, he's done pretty good. He went on a streak there for, I mean, we've, we've, you know, we've been winning, yep. uh, since I caught him really, uh, I've been learning and he's been learning and, <laughs> but yeah. we have been winning. So that's, that's good. We made him, uh, PKC champion and UKC night champion this uh this past year what so, uh tell me about your first hunt with him was you was you a little tentative was you relaxed were you nervous oh I was nervous I still, <laughs> nervous. <laughs> I still get nervous and none of my buddies like I've got I've got one one good coon hunting buddy that we've we've been friends for a really long time and we've always coon hunted together and really him and i are the only two that have stuck with it and he wasn't big into competition hunting either until until i got this dog and he didn't have a good coon dog at the time and i was like well it's just you know he's too much for me just to hunt yeah by myself so you know he stays here half the time and he's over there half the time and that's the only way we can keep him hunted up you know yeah what would your first cast go like with him Oh, oh gosh. Let's see. I think he did pretty good. I didn't win my first cast. So you, you've won so I, many casts this year that you can't hardly even remember your first one with him. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I think I was too worried about just calling it. I, yeah, it kind of went like, you know, I tried to call him and I said, you've got me right through there. And then he said, tree my dog. Yeah, I got you. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, it's just the lessons, you know, that was. What What was your mindset going into that? Because one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is uh, you had mentioned that, you know, the podcasts that we do and others do are one of your inspirations to get into the competition side of it. And when we started The Truth, I don't know how many, a couple of years ago, I think I've been doing this now. When we started The Truth, it was basically the premise that me and Chris Powell talked about was let's put competition coon hunting on the forefront and try to dispel some of these rumors about, uh, you, you've seen them just like I have. Everybody cheats. The dogs aren't any good. I've seen grand nights that couldn't tree a coon and you just, and it's usually from guys that haven't went out and even tried to experience what, what it's actually like, or they went out with a mindset that, with that mindset you know and then just completely had a bad time doing it so i mean your mindset going in to these first casts and how you took you know getting out handled or getting out what as a lesson is kind of the point behind all uh, of what we're doing so i mean i'm just liking to hear that part of it as far as you know how you looked at this going into it yeah i i basically really i just knew that i had to study the rule book and some things that you know i was like i knew it was in the rules but i wouldn't know where to apply it right. um uh but i never had got you know i never i don't think i've ever just gotten outright cheated yeah but i can see you know i definitely was you know luckily i got to hunt with some guys that taught me pretty good so i had to learn pretty quick on some things well i mean uh, you've already seen the difference between being out handled and cheated yeah definitely you know um 
and some people can't differentiate the two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you've have, you know, you have casts that are a little easier, you know, a little easier going than others. Uh, but as long as you just, you know, read that rule book and call your dog for what he's doing, that's really all you can do. Yeah. So, what, uh, uh, what about your first win? Do you remember your first win with him? Yeah. Our first win was a $55 open event. Yeah. Um, over here in Greenville, Tennessee, it's a little bit more rolling, uh, hills over on that side. And, um, we won it with, I'm pretty sure it was 175 plus. We just treed one coon and got struck second, uh, had her own tree and it, you know, time we got around there to him, he, uh, you know, hunt was over and that was it, you yeah. know. <laughs> was, that a, was that a pretty good feeling when that stopwatch went off there at the end of that cast? The Truth on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network is proud to partner with Cajun Lights. Cajun Lights can outfit all of your hunting light needs, everything from the high-quality Rogaroo, super bright, super versatile. They've got a Bayou, which is a mid-range price light. And then one of my personal favorites is the Micro Gator. I use that for big game hunting, finding tracks, just uh, general use. If I need a light on my head, I'm grabbing my micro gator. I've looked for bear tracks in that thing, lion tracks, cat tracks, coon hunting with it, hog hunting with it at night. I've even used it to work on the plumbing in the house. Super bright, super dependable. Everything that LW sells down there is high quality and the customer service is second to none every week i'm getting notifications that they're adding new items to their store they've got briar proof clothing coming out they got a jacket out right now that's really nice i put the vest through the paces this last bear season and coon season couldn't be happier with that i can't find anything there that i that i don't like and i like dealing with lw nixon and cajun lights so check them out you can go to houndsmanxp.com you can follow that link to cajun lights right from our website check them out folks yeah i was you know i was just hoping the whole because we i think we i think we even scored them i think we scored them out of order yeah is what happened so we were going to him last and one out of den and uh the other one was slick or den whatever and uh we're going around there to him and he's in a, a big walnut tree with no leaves on it moon was out and when we come around the field it was right on the edge of a field and you could just see the coon sitting there without without even turning the light on yeah. you know that, uh, I was tick- <laughs> that that is that's a feeling that i don't know can be replicated and it don't matter what level you're doing at whether it's at a local ukc hunt a club hunt or you just spent sixty five hundred dollars on an entry fee uh a lot of times with the people that really love it the feeling's the same no matter yeah. the no matter the outcome or the prize package or whatever now don't get me wrong we get a little more excited over winning a big hunt than we do a little hunt but it's still the same feeling and it's what we're all looking for yeah it's I, yeah I, I really like it i didn't think that i would like it as much as i do and now it's become like it's a it's a thing you know yeah. i'm looking at the book you're you know looking online at the pro hound seeing when the next hunts are or which what's close and um i got a pretty good partnership i can't can't complain my buddy uh trent hensley he helps me a lot with it and when i can't go to the hunts he's taking him and uh just doing good with him yeah I- well, one thing I did want to ask you, what did your wife say when you brought that dog home? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, not to bring that dog home. And I said, well, well, I've got him now. We're going to have to send him a check for him to send me the pack. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think I hunted him. I want to hunt with him before. Like, I think it was the it was the second or third hunt that I was in that we won. I think it was the second. So, yeah, you guys went yeah. went straight at it then. Yeah, we were ready for it, you know, and yeah. luckily, buddy, I gave him, I had an extra rule book and I got him, what was funny was he was on the fence about it and I said, come hunt with this dog and I, that's whenever I was trying to talk him into being a partner with me because uh-huh. I didn't hunt him as much as he needed to be. So he comes over here and the man I bought the dog from swore he'd never run a deer. While we were trying him out that night, a pack of deer dogs came through 
and he never, you know, never varied anything. Well, the first night he goes to hunting with me, he hits a hot deer track. It had just snowed. I, and he still hasn't done it since, but he run that thing about three good loops <laughs> and it just dumbfounded me. And, you know, he's, he's like, yeah, really, you want me to go in with you on this? Yeah. Dog? That's what they <laughs> usually do. Right. When you really need them to look good, they do something like that. Yeah. Craziness. Well, that's but, good. I like a dog that'll get a little trashy and wild every now and then. Yeah, I think he might have done a little bit of that at me at the Grand American, too. Yeah. Uh, he did something funny in there. I don't know. <laughs> Tell me <laughs> about, <laughs> you talked about how your first cast, you had a tree off to yourself. Um, was the dog naturally independent whenever you went to putting, putting him in the cast or putting him with dogs? Uh, did you guys do anything different with him as far as, you know, while you were hunting him to encourage that or discourage that or whatever? No, he was, uh, I mean, he's been pretty much, pretty much naturally independent. You know, if it's, he'll tree a coon out of the truck, uh, with everything, if he trees it first. Yeah. And if he doesn't, then he's going to pout around a little bit. Um, but usually he'll get on out of there, yeah. you know, expect out of the truck naturally uh, ind- naturally in- natural independence or natural well, I mean, there's a difference uh in-, in my opinion an independent dog will tree with other dogs a lot you know if another dog strikes a track trees it in front of them you know if they're running that same track they just don't know that dog's there or care that that dog's there and so that would be but a loner a natural loner has a tendency to pout when he gets beat and you yeah. know, all-, all of ours are very, very similar con does it scent rain shock duds you know a lot of them when they get if they get beat on a track you know they hang out just a little bit too long before they get the heck out of there yeah yeah that's that's the same way he is. he does there yeah and that's but just he, something that comes with the territory i think yeah he does um he's pretty good about hunting too i mean as far as when you cut him loose he hunts the woods you turn him in yeah uh, and if there's nothing there, I mean, if there's a coon there, he'll tree it. But if there's nothing there, he's going to, he's going to peel out and, you know, he's going to go find a coon somewhere. He's going to, he's been doing pretty good about it here late. The coons have been kind of on Oak ridges and stuff. Uh-huh. And he knows where to get around to find them and make something happen. What about his, uh, his recut, you know, cause that's a big deal competition hunting, you know, you're pulling him off a tree and you know a lot of times there's going to be a coon in it and especially if a dog's been getting you know a lot of coons killed to it or something like that you know the recut can be difficult some of them are just naturally not good at it was he pretty good at it from the get-go whenever we were killing coons to him no it was it was hard yeah um it was i had it was something i had to work on i basically had to cut him i would cut him i think i i think i heard it on maybe your podcast i believe on one of them but I would cut him off the tree and stand at the tree yep. and not let him come back in. And he would come back in. I just have a, you know, a switch ready. You know, yep. I wouldn't, you wouldn't have to get on him hard, just shake it at him and talk hard to him and get on out of there. Yeah. But and he picked, it it, he hard. picked it up pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, he does. I mean, every now and then he might, you know, make a liar out of you or do something stupid. But for the most part, whenever you get him out of there, he's going on hunting again. Yeah. Just, you, you guys mentioned that you're both hunting him a little bit and keeping him hunted. Does he operate the same for both of you equally? Is it a little different from one handler to the other? I think that he does because Trent's he's done he's done a pretty pretty good bit of hand uh, winning with him too. Yeah. Uh, I've handled him more than more than him, but he's still won probably over half of the hunts that he's you know that he's handled him in. So yeah. Who's who's the best handler? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'd say we're pretty equal there. Do because uh, I know what me and Finley do he does, he is when the rules better. yeah when one of us wins we give the other one hell. So I assume it might be a little bit with you two same way. Yeah, yeah. Um, he knows the rules better than me, but I I don't know. Yeah. I think it's about the, it's per, it's pretty equal. I'd say. And, you know, partnerships are really important if you're going to campaign a dog. You know, for working class guys like me and you, uh, you know, you got a family, you got a job, you got, you know, other things in life that are more important than the coon dog to take care of first, of course. 
but that dog still needs hunted. So to have a team behind it is way easier. And I assume that's what you guys were thinking whenever this all came about. Well, that's what I was thinking. I knew, I knew right out of the gate, I was going to have to find somebody. And yeah. he was, you know, we've been, we've been really good friends for, you know, we met in our sophomore year of high school. So, and we've been friends and coon hunted together and fished together and, ginseng hunted together and everything under the sun since then so and we have a lot of the same mentality on you know what to do with a dog and handle a dog a lot the same and everything yeah what what about tell me about ginseng hunting we don't have that here (laughs) (laughs) oh man it's uh it's a side. I'm going to sidetrack a little bit, but you mentioned it so now I want to bring it up because I've seen some documentaries and stuff it looks like it gets pretty wild I, I, well, that's, that's, that, those videos are a little crazy. That's kind of what I'm, that's kind of what those are made for TV stuff. Um, yeah. They had to have some drama, yeah. you know, I have walked up and, you know, like you realize you're in a place where maybe you need to get out of there and, uh, but nothing crazy like that at all. Not at all. Yeah. Is it's, it, is it pretty enough. good? You know, you can just go out and you can try to find some, if you're good at it, maybe make a little extra cash. Well, yeah, I like, you know, it's pretty good extra cash. And on top of that, I got to, you know, you get to roam the woods and scout and, you know, see stuff in the daytime that you didn't get to see at nighttime while you're, you know, coon hunting. And, um, it is pretty good, pretty good extra money though. How does one go about finding ginseng? Uh, you want to look for, you know, like a dark, a dark holler probably like a north facing holler with poplar i like to look for poplars and grape vines um maybe big rocks yeah. somewhere that hasn't bothered in a long time and um yeah you just kind of look you just got to get the eye for it you know huh. it doesn't always have the berries on it and it's not always green sometimes it's yellow or sometimes some of the leaves will be missing off of it or sometimes there's no leaves and you just all you can see is the the stem from the berry where the berries were yeah. you know what so, what's a good haul on a on a good ginseng hunt what's what's a what's a really good day i always like to get i always try to get at least a pound of wet saying a day yeah fresh dug ginseng a day and that was about three hundred dollars worth you really know you wanted to sell it that day you could get about 300 dollars for it yeah is it seasonal yes um set well really you're supposed to start digging it the first of september is whenever it comes in yeah like the gin season does ever does everybody wait till ginseng season <laughs> probably not because <laughs> that I, don't I, at 300 dollars a pound that don't strike me as something where i even i would be out there I'm like you know it's august something i'd probably be all right digging a little yeah yeah, you find a monster root. I've got a, I've got a lot of a lot of places where I was digging were places that were going to be turned into developments and stuff, and so I would take everything through there because it was just going to get bulldozed. Yeah, and all the little stuff, the big stuff I would sell, and then the little stuff I would take back to my place and transplant it. Oh, and, I, uh, I didn't even know you could transplant it. Yeah, I mean, as long as the dirt's good, and you know, you try to do it that day you know most of the time it'll it'll go i've put some in flower pots really that are you know still coming up just put it in the shade and forget about it what Uh, what, tell me about the developments and all that stuff is that a problem out there because i know um i don't want to mention any places because i don't want to put it out to the world but there's a lot of places especially south of me that especially during covid uh, people wanted to get out of the city. They wanted to move in. And then some of these larger landowners were getting bought out by like a real estate speculator. And then they would come in and lot it up in five acre lots. And the people that wanted to get out of the city to move to the country, which I don't blame them. Uh, I would, I would want to, too. Uh, they'll go in and just snatch that up and they'll build a house. And next thing I know, there's a community out in the middle of nowhere. Is that, is that a problem out there where you guys are too? Yeah. You know, all the, all the, kids that inherited these farms from their family just wanted the money you know instead yeah. of pre- pre- land and so basically like where the good hay fields and you know good pasture land and stuff was was turned is turned into developments and then 
you know, pretty tight housing and then the mountain property, you know, they'll take it and like you said, split it up into acre and a half or, you know, two acre tracks and yeah. build all over it. So yeah, that's happening a lot, you know, especially where I grew up at. It's starting to become a thing here where I'm at now. Yeah. Uh, it seems like, you know, everybody, which we, we live in a real, real rural area here. We got like 3000 people in our entire County. Um, we have good farmland and we don't have any major cities within, I think Des Moines, Iowa would be a hundred miles from me would be the closest m metropolitan area. And so we haven't seen any of it, but you know, I get down into South Missouri or I get into, you know, certain other parts. It seems like it's just getting cut up like crazy. Yeah. It's, it's pretty awful. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't stand it. No, no, it makes me, makes me sick too. I, and I mean, how does that affect you? Well, we all know how it affects the hunting. I assume it just makes it near impossible in some of those places. Yeah. I mean, cause you'll have permission to hunt this, you know, side of a mountain up here you know might be 100 acres 150 acres and somebody just on the other side might buy might buy an acre right there and put a house well yeah. you know anywhere your dog trees on that side of the mountain they're gonna hear it and, you know you have people fuss and but well you know, you you gotta gonna, do what you can do. you're just gonna have to come out here to north missouri where all these coons are and there ain't no folks i'm telling you i'm ready like i said <laughs> we're uh I'm ready for it. Yeah. So what do you got planned? We ain't even talked about the name of your dog. What's the name of your dog? Uh, his full name is Reagan's late round rage. Yeah. Uh, but he just goes by rage. Yeah. What, uh, what, what are your guys' plans for rage in the future? Well, I'm just going to keep hunting him. Uh, I'm wanting to grand him out and, uh, just, I, I really like the PKC hunts. I kind of, if I like to hunt UKC local, but if I'm going off far to a hunt, I want to have a winner, yeah. you know? Um, so, but yeah, you know, we've, uh, we've hunted a few pro classics and, uh, didn't do great at all in the first one. Uh, rage was a little too interested on a female that was there. And, uh, the second one he did decent in, but we didn't win it, but we're going to keep on keep on with it uh we've kind of been looking for some i've kind of been looking for a female uh i'd like to i'd really like to get something out of him before he if i breed him now you know and i raise a pup you know he'll be to see if they're any good i don't want, don't want him to don't want to wait too late so. no and i i agree with that if you got a dog that you like uh because you know just as well as i do anything can happen you know, especially with, I assume rage is a fairly hard hunting dog. Uh, yes. you know, you're going to have roads, you're going to have, you know, you know, a GPS malfunction in the mountains and all of a sudden you're having a hard time hearing your dog and you can't find him, you know, anything could happen. So I always encourage people that yeah. if you know, for sure, at one point you want a pup out of this dog, uh, just go do it, just get it yeah. over with. I know sometimes guys are worried that it's going to affect the way they hunt. Uh, and it does sometimes it does mess with the dog a little bit. But, uh, the guys that are really worried about that are the guys that you can usually just go pick up another dog at any point in any way. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely don't know if I could, uh, I don't, it would be hard to find another one like him. I mean, he's, he's picture perfect. I mean, for a walker, if you, if I look, want to think about a walker in my head, he's just, you know, that's it. Redheaded blanket back just beautiful dog and on top of that he's got he's got a big mouth he hunts hard um you know he's gotten pretty dang accurate um he'll still miss a little bit but and he's bred really well yeah uh, what's he bred like uh he's out of uh he's directly out of neosha river's cuz on the top side mm -hmm. and the bottom side his mother is out of uh Lyle borgen's dog from wisconsin uh jam and jenna and she is a semen puppy out of rock river fiddler yeah and uh dizzy's dolly yeah which is out of dahoney's dizzy and dahoney's brandy yeah and D and he was out of boone i believe dahoney i believe he was out of Don dahoney's boone if i remember right that's some old yeah. old stuff down there on the bottom side yeah um 
Rock River Fiddler was the direct son of Sackett Jr. Yep. Um, so he's got Jr. right up close right there. Yeah, and Cuz has been a fantastic reproducer. Yes, I've yeah. hunted with uh, a few of them, and I yeah. liked them, all the ones I've hunted I with. I have. A lot of the ones I've hunted with are, as you described, you know, they're good mouths, good-looking dogs, uh, open on the ground, but not a lot. Uh, open, mm. open just right in my opinion, you know, a really good reproducer. And I, I have no reason to think that his, his sons wouldn't be as well. Yeah. I, I hope, I mean, I've even done a little bit of, sh uh, on the bench with him. Uh, we won class or whatever class and breed yep. or whatever with him the other day. Uh, I might do a little bit more of that down the road, the, the, just the showing part, just, just because, Yeah, but but yeah, we're just going to keep on hunting him. And as long as he, you know, we, we hit a little bump in the road and we try to fix it and then go back, you know, Friday, Saturday night and see if it works. So, well, Colby, I've always enjoyed, uh, the updates on the dog and your background and backstory. And, you know, I want to take a little credit that the reason you're winning with this dog is because you listen to me on the podcast. <laughs> well, you know, that that's, that has a lot to do with it. Honestly, it really does. Uh, I decided if I wanted to win, I didn't want to fool around with nothing else. You know, you got to go with what's winning, and that's what I did. And it's, you know, it's paid off. I'm glad I didn't just go get the first. Well, I really did go get the first one I found, but <laughs> but you <laughs> knew you got to be a good one. So. Yeah, you knew what you were looking for whenever you left to go find a dog. Right, I knew I wanted to do. I've always liked genetics and breeding and stuff, so I knew I wanted something that was bred good on top of having hunting ability yeah and i know sure. you got to give yourself some credit too because um it's not easy to get a dog into the winner's circle i don't care if you raise it from an eight week old pup or you buy a, a six-year-old platinum champion uh it's hard to get a dog in the winner's circle consistently so i mean that's some credit to you you said you knew what a good dog was and you're you found one and you you got him right and you got him in the winner's circle so i mean congratulations yeah, I I appreciate it. And that was that was a goal that we would set. Uh, we had our our little girl in uh, last March, uh, so we've been raising her on top of trying to hunt and stuff. But we've gotten, I think nine. Oh, and I've carried her coon hunting a lot. She's yeah. uh, I put her in that satchel on the front, you know, and we'd go through the woods while <laughs> Mama was uh, at work. So <laughs> does your, does but, your wife but, like rage now that he's winning a little bit? Oh yeah. 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 She loves him. <laughs> she loves him. We've got, you know, oh man, we've done, uh, I think we've won nine, nine UKC hunts and probably 15 or 16 or something like that. 18 PKC hunts. Yeah. You're, you're doing well. You're well on his way. How old is Rage? He will be four July 7th. Yeah. So he's got, he, he would hunt spring super stakes this year away. Right? he would if i was able to take him yeah. um i wish i could go he's quality he's you know he's he's won his money and everything so yeah but it's just you know well i i think that uh you guys are well on your path to success and you've already had quite a bit uh i hope you keep it up colby and i really want to make sure make sure and keep me updated let me know how rage is doing and uh if you do decide to breed a female run it by me I definitely will, and I'll, I'm sure you'll hear from me with some questions in the future for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'll help any way I can. Sometimes I give advice, and sometimes it's even good. Hey, well, every time I've asked for advice before we ever spoke, you've uh, you've reached out and you know helped me out with it. So I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, Colby. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap this up? Um, I just wanted to, you know thank god for keeping me you know in able body to keep doing this and thank my wife for putting up with it all and <laughs> everybody that supported me along the way i've just uh you know wasn't for that i wouldn't be able to do it so you're right it takes a team at home at home and on the road both that's it exactly that's it it does it definitely takes a team all right Kobe. well i look forward to hearing from you again uh, we'll wrap this up and uh you know, just keep after it. Keep him hunted up, and good luck on some more success down the road. 
We'll do it, Josh. Thank you for thank you for the uh, opportunity to come on and do this. You're welcome, Colby. Anytime, buddy. We'll do it again. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. And that is all we have, folks, for the truth on the Houseman XP Podcast Network. We thank you for listening.